Welcome everyone to the Yale Conference on Japanese Soft Power in East Asia. Uh, my name is Dan Mattingly. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science here at Yale, also a member of the Council on East Asian Studies. And I'm delighted to welcome everyone to this event. Uh, we'd like to thank especially the Consulate General of um, uh, Japan uh, um, and uh, the, uh, in Boston for generous funding and especially Setsu Omori, the Consul General of the Consul General of Japan in Boston. Uh, so this is a, a workshop on soft power competition and especially Japanese soft power in East Asia, soft power uh, competition in East Asia, I think is of growing importance as Japan, a long time soft power superpower uh, in the region now faces China, which has considerable ambitions to overtake Japan and the United States as a significant soft power player, especially in East Asia. So in this workshop, we'll have two papers. Uh, we're going to start with uh, the logic of soft power competition evidence in East Asia. We'll have a brief uh, break from 825 to 840, a short intermission. And then we'll uh, have the paper, Does Public Diplomacy Sway Foreign Opinion? identifying the effect of high level visits. Uh, so we have a really fantastic, amazing crew of panelists who are uh, part of this. And so I'd like people to go around and uh, briefly uh, introduce themselves in alphabetical order by, uh, by last name. Um, so I'd like to start with, uh, if you could just briefly identify who you are and the institution you're from, uh, starting with Amy Catalinic from NYU. Hi everyone, Amy Katalinek from NYU. Long story about how I, uh, my career is the product of soft power efforts by Japan and New Zealand omitted, but uh, happy to share that uh, at this time. Great, thanks. Uh, next, uh, Charles. I'm uh, Charles Crabtree, Assistant Professor of Government at Dartmouth College. Uh, really happy to be here. Graham, if you wouldn't mind. Hi, I'm Graham Davis, Professor of International Security at the University of York in the UK. Thank you. Hey, Christina. Christina Davis, Professor of Government and Director of the Program on US-Japan Relations at Harvard University. Okay, and if our panelists can see the list now that's in the chat, you can also just jump in. Um, so uh, Benjamin Goldsmith is next. Uh, yeah, good morning uh, fr from Australia. I'm, I'm Ben Goldsmith, a professor uh, of political science in the School of Politics and International Relations at the Australian National University uh, and also head of school. Thanks very much for inviting, inviting me and our paper. Hi, I am Naima Green Riley. I'm a PhD candidate at Harvard University and really excited about this entire program because I was once in a former career, a public diplomacy officer at the State Department. So I'm Yusaku Horiuchi, professor of government and Mitsui professor of Japanese studies at Dartmouth. And also, I'm also very happy to attend this conference and presenting our new paper. Hi, I'm Trevor Inserti. I'm a PhD candidate at Yale University. I'm currently a visiting research fellow at the University of Tokyo Institute of Social Science uh, and an associate researcher at the Waseda University Institute of Political Economy. Hi, I'm Chang Wuk Jiu, or Chang, if that's more um, convenient for you to pronounce. And I'm a third year PhD student in political science here at Yale. And I study security and military studies um, broadly defined. Uh, I don't have a list in my hand, but uh, my last name starts from a K, so probably me. Taehyo Kim from Songgyungwan University, South Korea, Seoul. I'm a professor of political science and a dean at graduate school for a national strategy. Uh, good to meet you, everybody, and uh, look forward to good papers and discussions. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Tetsuro Kobayashi from uh, Department of Media and Communication at the City University of Hong Kong. I study political communication, political psychology, and public opinion in East Asian countries. Good to see you. Hi, I'm Anado Kobayashi, uh, Yoshi Kobayashi, and I am an associate professor at the University of Leeds in the UK. Hi, everyone. My name is Tom Lee. I'm an assistant professor of politics at Pomona College out in California. Happy to be here. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Adam Liff, Associate Professor of East Asian International Relations at the Hamilton Luber School at Indiana University, where I also run the 21st Century Japan Politics and Society Initiative. Glad to be here. Good morning. I'm Si Jung Dim. Um, I'm an Associate Professor at the Division of International Studies at Korea University. We will be joined uh, later by Jennifer Lind, uh, Professor of Government at Dartmouth College. And I'm Philip Lipsy. I'm associate professor at University of Toronto, where I also direct the Center for the Study of Global Japan. Uh, great to see you all. Um, I'm Kelly Matouche. I'm an assistant professor of political science at Florida State University. I forgot to introduce myself. Again, I'm, I'm Daniel Mattingly. I'm an assistant professor of political science at Yale University. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Colin Morshed. I'm a second year student uh, in the political science department at Yale. Uh, and I'm so glad to see all of you here after having corresponded with most of you. Um, so glad you're all here. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kenneth McElwain. I'm a professor at the Institute of Social Science at the University of Tokyo. Great to see everybody. So we have uh, Professor Nye also as well. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, my list is, my participants list is not alphabetical. Uh, I'm Joe Nye, uh, former dean at the Kennedy School, and now a research professor at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Uh, hello, I'm Maria Rapnikova. I'm an assistant professor of global communication at Georgia State University and currently a Wilson Fellow. I'm writing two books on Chinese soft power. Really excited to be here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Daniel Smith. I'm an associate professor of government at Harvard University. Thank you for having me uh, participate in this event. Morning. Uh, my name is Atsushi Tago. Uh, I'm associate dean uh, of the Graduate School of Political Science, Waseda University in Tokyo. We have uh, Seiki Tanaka, who will uh, be possibly joining us uh, later this evening. Hi, I'm Mike Thies. Uh, I'm at UCLA in the Political Science Department and Chair of Global Studies. Hi, I'm Mike Toms. I'm a professor of political science at Stanford. I'm also the chair of the political science department and a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. Looking forward to having this conversation with you today. Hi, I'm Hikari Yamagishi. I'm a PhD candidate at Yale. Thank you. Thanks everyone. So first up, we have a paper on which I'm a co-author of uh, a really great team uh, including a fantastic group of PhD students from Yale, uh, Chang Wu Chu, Colin Morrishead, Hikari Yamaguchi, uh, and Trevor Inserti, as well as uh, Francis Rosenbluth, and I hear also of uh, Yale, and Seiki Tanaka at the University of Groningen. And so presenting our paper will be uh, Chang Wu Chu, Colin Morrishead, and Hikari Yamagishi. So uh, without further ado, Hikaru, uh, please take it away. All right. So today we're presenting the pa our paper on the logic of soft power competition with survey evidence from Asia. We'd like to give our great thanks to the Consulate General of Japan in Boston for generous funding for our research, providing us an opportunity to study questions of great theoretical and practical importance and of our personal and professional interests. Thank you very much. So the historical backdrop of our inquiry in are two East Asian countries vying for regional dominance. Japan's preeminence as the region's exporter has waned a little since its post-World War II heyday, but observers note that Japan is building its coffers of another product, its gross national coal, as some call it. In his long reign in office, former, former Prime Minister Abe led a Cool Japan program, a multi-ministry effort coordinated by the cabinet office with specific goals like increasing trade and tourism, product purchases, attracting foreign public opinion for foreign policy and so on. And we pick this picture as perhaps an emblematic moment at the 2016 Rio Summer Olympics closing ceremony, the handover ceremony where there was a video montage with Japanese athletes, Hello Kitty, classic manga characters, and Prime Minister Abe stuck in Tokyo traffic in the beginning saying he won't make it to Rio on time, but with the help of um, Super Mario, the video game, and his friends, he teleports through a pipe and pops up in the middle of the stadium at Rio as Mario. A viral moment, but for us, a point, the point being that 
you know, uh, the softer side of even the softer side of soft power, animation, cuisine, it's not just bottom up and political leaders are actively harnessing these resources for promotion and policy for national gains. And Chinese leaders have thrown their hats in the ring as well. Here are some quotes from former President Hu. We must enhance culture as part of soft power and President Xi. The vision is that Chinese cultural soft power has grown much stronger. So this is in the CCP Congress sessions. So with the aim of winning this public opinion war, the Chinese Communist Party sees increasing the country's soft power as a core national goal and has spent lavishly on efforts like the Belt and Road Initiative as well. So in this new era of soft power competition, our question is, does soft power influence global attitudes? What soft power resources work and under what conditions? So right now I'm spending a quick three slides on an overview and then um, I'll go a little deeper into the theory and then um, Colin and Chung will take over for case selection and design and I'll, I'll do some closing remarks. So we go, there's a um, robust literature um, on soft power in political science. And building on NI, we structure our theoretical framework with three key soft power resources. So the first is culture, things like art and drama. The second one is political values, such as freedom of speech and a responsible government, bill of rights, and so forth. And finally, foreign policy, another country's official international relations policy with one's home country. So with this framework, our main theory is as old, the insight is practically as old as the concept of soft power itself, but it's that domestic political context matters. So more specifically, when the bilateral relations are depoliticized in the domestic political arena, soft power efforts can work. But when bilateral relations are politicized, in domestic politics, they can backfire. Excuse me. Oh, there we go. Our main result, oh, rather, sorry, our research design. So we use a survey experiment set up and we expose the audience to soft power promotion efforts by China and Japan in two key cases. So South Korea first, where the South Korea relationship, oh sorry, South Korea Japan relationship and the South Korea China relationship are politicized in domestic politics. And Malaysia, where the Malaysia Japan relationship and the Malaysia China relationship are relatively depoliticized. Our key results are that soft power can be effective in non politicized environments but backfires in, politic in politicized environments. So we find that in Malaysia, soft power e efforts succeeded in changing cooperative attitudes towards each of the countries promoting soft power, but in South K Korea, they backfired. Our second point is that content matters. Soft power researchers showed similar patterns of effectiveness across contexts. So for instance, foreign aid and culture were more effective in moving respondents um, willingness to cooperate favorably, whereas um, treatments showing political values were less effective. And we'll discuss this later, whether it was because of our setup or because of um, oh, various factors we'll talk about later. The theoretical payoffs of our paper. We theorize and test soft power's effects across the three, these three core soft power resources. We show how aid influence attitudes in non-recipient countries and we contribute to the literature on public diplomacy. So diving in further into our theory. So there are three types of soft power resources. The first one is culture. So these are things such as art, literature, various uh, cuisine and so forth that increases the attractiveness of a country's profile to the recipient individual. This is an image of Pokemon characters and um, Son Goku uh, animation character from Japan at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. 
Um, foreign policy, theoretically, is a host of different policy initiatives. Um, in, our in our study today, we focus on international aid. This is a picture of ODA being delivered from Japan. And political values. So this um, has been long established in the literature, um, originally by Nye and others as emblematic from the US's uh, robust democratic liberalism. Um, this picture is from the 1960s US-Japan security protests in Japan. So that's the Diet building and that's all those people protesting. So our theory from the individual level, so on the right here is kind of the um, original environment in which an individual is operating. So this is a low politicization country, say it's country X, and this is a treatment, a dosage of any soft power resource. So let's say this is Japan. Um, uh, let's say this is a documentary on Japanese um, beverage making and its origins of whiskey, for instance. And when the environment is low politicized, low, not as well politicized to begin with, it's more or less a blank slate or less politicized slate. So the individual sees this, is exposed. They have updates about their beliefs about the foreign nation and its trustworthiness and coolness. And we hypothesize that it increases support for security and or economic relationships. So next time they're out for a gift for a friend, they might look for a Japanese whiskey rather than something else. On the other hand, this is another country, country Y, in a highly politicized environment. And again, they might get exposure to a soft power resource. But in this case, the mechanism is a, is a little bit different because they already have priors about the country. And what happens is it's rather than updating information, it's more of a prime that associates back to their already held negative emotional reactions, which lead to less support for security and economic relationships. So a note for this, um, this slide is that it's not necessarily that a priming is going to lead to less cooperative behavior in terms of the bilateral relationship. It's that empirically we find that we, the literature finds and we work within a framework where more countries, when they politicize a bilateral relationship, it's more antagonistic and in a negative sense than a positive one, um, unfortunately. And so that's why when they get primed about a politicized relationship, the result is negative. It's not necessarily about the having the prime or not itself. All right, so moving on to case selection, Colin. Okay, um, so with full understanding that this panel is awash with experts on uh, the region, uh, I'm going to hazard an introduction of our soft power senders. These are the two countries really vying for influence through soft power in East Asia and abroad. Um, so they have fairly distinct characteristics. I think everybody here is uh, probably familiar with. Uh, Japan has relatively successful soft cultural power uh, and its economic success is very well known. Uh, the Japanese government has spent uh, quite a lot on developmental assistance and foreign aid programs throughout the post-war era. Chinese cultural power has considerable reach depending on the content type and market and the government emphasis on this is increasing. Uh, additionally, China's growth rate over the past few decades has gotten it the sort of attention uh, I think that Japan received for uh, the economic miracle. Uh, and recently we've seen huge, highly publicized developments like the One Belt, One Road initiative, which are sort of meant to showcase um, Chinese assistance within a broader foreign policy framework. Uh, so now I'll quickly run through the dyads of our cases. Uh, so up top, I should, I should note that there's not really a perfectly politicized or depoliticized case to do this experiment. Uh, we made our assessments on which countries might work best as cases from the background on the theoretical dimensions and survey data from over the years about favorability toward Japan and China. And we'll see more on that data shortly. Um, but first up, the Japan-South Korea relationship has been pretty fraught for a very long time. Uh, so despite a shared status as developed democracies, we see highly politicized bilateral relations uh, because of historical factors like wars, colonial legacy, uh, and more current pressing issues like secu security cooperation and territorial disputes. 
Uh, South Korea is not really a uh, recipient of Japanese aid, uh, and Japanese cultural goods are often targeted in South Korean boycotts. Malaysia, in this case, is non-politicized with um, Japan since uh, bilateral relations don't really feature in uh, domestic politics of Malaysia. So Malaysians are consumers of Japanese products. Uh, they've also received considerable funding and technical assistance from Japan since the 1960s. Uh, moving on to the China side, um, we see, I think, uh, a different sort of case with the China-South Korea relationship. It's politicized for very different reasons. Um, the primary clash here between these countries is over political issues and security issues. And so we've seen disputes over human rights issues, uh, mischaracterizations of the South Korean government's positions, uh, and the Chinese relationship with North Korea um, can also cause issues. So again, South Korea is not really a recipient of Chinese aid, of course, uh, and although South Koreans do consume uh, Chinese goods and cultural products, I think that's the, the extent of the, the relationship there. Um, Malaysia, once again, has little or no politicization on relations with China, so it's a recipient of loans as part of uh, BRI. Um, we have seen a willingness to be selective about which projects uh, the Malaysian government wants to accept as part of the One Belt, One Road initiative. There's also a large ethnic Chinese minority in Malaysia, but the domestic racial cleavages haven't really spilled over into the bilateral relations with China. So moving on, I think um, we have a, a two by two here that, that lays out in sort of the simplest terms, I think what our expectations should be based on the assessments of these dyads politicization levels. Uh, so the Japan-South Korea relationship is highly politicized, which suggests that we would have a backlash effect. Uh, in the China-South Korea dyad, we see relatively less politicization, but it still exists. Uh, and so there's perhaps an opportunity for within case variation uh, among the South Korea respondents uh, versus the, the Japan case. Malaysia, Japan isn't politicized, so we should hopefully see some positive effects from treatments. And uh, the same goes for Malaysia, China. Uh, so all in all, I think you can see we expect to see soft power efforts by both countries doing better in Malaysia than in South Korea. Uh, and then we might expect to see some variation among the South Korea respondent groups. Okay, so this is a feeling thermometer that we took from our respondents to visualize and sort of justify that set of expectations. Uh, so what you're seeing here on the y-axis is number of respondents and the x-axis is feelings uh, with 10 being most positive. So what we have here is like a, a sort of density plot uh, of feelings towards the countries. And as you can see, the South Korean respondents are really quite negative about both Japan and China, whereas the Malaysian respondents are pretty much more positive about both countries. Uh, and now we'll take a look at the surveys. So we fielded two surveys, uh, one in South Korea and one in Malaysia. Uh, each survey was completed in the primary local language, so Korean and Malay, respectively. Uh, our first wave went out early this month. We've just finished our second wave this week, which followed up with respondents between five and seven days after completion of the first wave. And our intent for that second wave is really to interrogate whether these uh, treatment effects are sticky. Um, so the results didn't make it into the paper because of time considerations, but they will be going into uh, future iterations. We hope you stay tuned. Uh, so the surveys were administered by Dynata, which is an online market research company operating in both South Korea and Malaysia. Uh, for sampling, we stratified age and gender to best approximate the sample to the broader populations. And as a result, uh, the Malaysian sample we got matches uh, more or less on both age and gender. The South Korean sample matches on gender and skews just ever so slightly young uh, compared with the broader population. And so overall, these screenings uh, gave us samples of 2,740 in South Korea and 2,716 in Malaysia. Uh, so we have three soft power treatment groups uh, and a control group in both countries. So the three soft power treatment groups are meant to track the theoretical categories of soft power. So cultural products on the culture dimension, politics uh, as operationalized by protest, and foreign policy here is in the form of foreign aid. Uh, so our two soft power senders or diffusers in East Asia being Japan and China. Uh, we used video treatments rather than uh, conventional vignettes. And 
this was difficult, finding comparable video treatments between Japan and China to send sort of comparable messaging uh, was a challenge. We think that using the real video treatments better approximates how people in South Korea and Malaysia are going to encounter soft power. Uh, so these videos are drawn from fictional media and news clips from each country. Uh, and, you know, we would love to have our respondents watch My Neighbor Totoro in its entirety. Uh, but unfortunately, time and money are both limited. So treatments are limited to only a few minutes. Um, and we have in total a three by two factorial design with a control. So ending up with seven groups in total. Uh, respondents were randomly assigned to the groups and watched at least 100 seconds of the corresponding video treatment. Uh, so to go into a little more detail on that, I will hand it over to Chang Wook. Oh, thanks, Iko, and thanks, Colleen. Since our seminar participants didn't have a chance to see the actual um, treatment videos, uh, let me briefly describe them. Uh, for the control video, uh, we featured nature and uh, flowers, which we think are unrelated to soft power in Japan and China. For Japanese uh, cultural soft power, we chose, a, uh, we chose a popular Japanese anime entitled My Neighbor Totoro. Uh, for Japanese cultural soft power, uh, we chose a video showing how Japanese citizens demonstrate their grievances toward their government, uh, especially uh, toward the former prime minister, Abe. For the Japanese foreign, foreign aid treatment, uh, we chose a, a video of MOFA promoting Japanese contribution to nation building projects in developing countries. Uh, the video focuses on foreign aid for countries other than South Korea and Malaysia. So it suggests the general foreign policy, not the, not the direct payment or benefit to the target countries. Uh, moving on to Chinese soft power treatment. Uh, for comparability issue, um, the treatment selections for uh, Chinese soft power largely echo the selections for the Japanese soft power. Uh, with the same control video, we use another media clip from a popular Chinese hist historical drama entitled The Longest Day in Chang'an. Um, for, for Chinese political soft power, we chose a video clip showing uh, people in Hong Kong protesting against the Chinese government. For the Chinese foreign aid treatment, we employed a Chinese uh, we, we employed a Chinese state media's promotion video on the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, all the treatment videos are translated and subtitled according to the um, soft power, uh, according to the soft power receivers' respective languages, i.e. Um, Korean and, and Malay. And moving on to um, the, the key outcomes, uh, we focus on three domains of uh, international relations and political economy. For economic consumption variable, uh, we asked respondents whether they preferred to purchase Chinese or Japanese electronic products. Uh, respondents were given a choice between a Chinese brand and a Japanese brand for three product lines, smartphone, TV, and, and home appliance. Each brand was randomly drawn from the listed brands here on the screen. Um, and respondents were asked to indicate whether they preferred one over the other on a 100 point prob probability scale. We randomized the pair and the ordering of brands and also the order of the three electronic items. We later rescaled the responses so, so the 100% represent a purchase, of this Chinese, a purchase of the Chinese brand over the competing Japanese brand. For the two cooperation questions, we asked respondents whether they think Korea or Malaysia should cooperate uh, more with Japan or China on trade or security matters. The responses were measured on a seven point Likert scale running from strongly agree to uh, strongly disagree. Uh, and moving on to uh, our, our kind of mechanism test, in addition to the key outcomes that we uh, just rendered, we also measured potential outcomes, uh, sorry, potential mechanisms. First, we asked respondents how cool they think Japan and China is. The responses on this statement were measured on a five point scale. And second, we provided them with an 11 point scale where, where they um, can indicate their emotions toward Japan and China respectively. Third, uh, we gathered three types of um, generalized trust, uh, be they favorability rating of Japan and China, political trust for the Japanese and Chinese government, and economic trust for Japanese and Chinese products, all of which were measured on a 100 point scale. Our estimation strategy is the um, difference in means. And um, it's been reported that pandemic replication surveys are comparable to pre-pandemic surveys, but with some smaller effect sizes. Uh, since our surveys were conducted during COVID-19, 
uh, the estimates of our uh, treatment effects may be somewhat conservative. Uh, as for the main result, um, the number one takeaway um, is that soft power promotion uh, can backfire if the bilateral relations are politicized. So for this figure, we combine all outcome variables into a single dimensional in index for each soft power center. And we also conflated all Japanese or Chinese treatments for each country. We found a large backlash against the, the Japanese soft power message in South Korea, while the, while the Chinese soft power message featured a positive impact in Malaysia. And then uh, we, um, we examined the effect of each, uh, each treatment on all the major outcome, uh, outcome questions using the same, um, same strategy to aggregate the questions. Uh, here we observe some hierarchical structure of soft power sources. For example, in Malaysia, advertising uh, foreign aid significantly moves respondents' attitudes uh, in a positive direction. And it seems cultural promoting efforts can also pay off in, in Malaysia. However, uh, media exposure to protests is found to have no effect or elicit a, a significant backlash for the Japanese treatment. In South Korea, we found a backlash against all Japanese soft power treatments and the Chinese prote protest treatment. Uh, we think the, the, the protest may have caused respondents to update their prior beliefs about the, um, the trustworthiness of the Japanese government. Uh, moving on, uh, we also investigated the mechanisms in which our treatments uh, moved respondents' perceptions about the soft power centers. The most notable pattern here is that <clears throat> all treatments cause strong negative emotional reactions among South Korean respondents vis-a-vis -vis Japan and China. In Malaysia, we observed strong, uh, strong reg negative reactions to both Japanese and Chinese protests, while the Japanese cultural treatment induced some positive impact. Interestingly, uh, we observed the positive impact of Chinese aid and the negative impact of, of Japanese protests on Malaysian respondents' perception about the two um, soft power, the two soft power centers, trustworthiness and cool Japan or cool China. Uh, we can interpret this in line with our finding in the paper that the, um, the Chinese aid video works for Malaysian re respondents on security and trade cooperation. And another finding that Japanese protest video backfires, making Malaysian respondents dislike security and trade cooperation with Japan. So in sum, emotion seems to drive the backlash we observe in a politicized setting like in South Korea, and generalized trust and coolness matter for um, security and trade cooperation in a depoliticized setting like in Malaysia. Uh, with that, uh, over to you, Hikaru. Great. So for future research, there's two avenues that we'd like to highlight. First, one of the three soft power resources, political values. So we found um, that this, we would like to unpack this further. Our hypothesis was that the protests will show freedom, but perhaps this was our political science minds working too readily. Um, the inherent kind of paradox of a protest is that when you show someone do, um, protesting against the government, that definitely means that the government is doing something that's not matching the will of certain people. So it might be, it might look like a vision of conflict and disorder. Um, one way to push forward is to show a retrospective narrative of when citizens protested and the government changed in response. Um, and there are also other dimensions of political values to explore. We might have been too Western liberal dem democratic in our conception of political values. There are many other dimensions like economic performance, democratic process, um, popular responsiveness that can show attractive institutional features in different forms. Uh, secondly, we are left with, we, with a question of long run effects of soft power we realize that our design is a small amount of exposure, although similar to government public diplomacy efforts, perhaps. And we can't manipulate how much country a soft power has at the baseline. We can try to understand long run change in soft power, however, using panel surveys and field experiments over time. And um, some examples being uh, such as an encouragement design in the field. We could um, have people subscribe to one-year subscriptions of 
randomly Chinese or Japanese media, for instance, and see how this slowly changes their long-term perceptions and so on. In summary, in this paper, we propose a logic of soft power competition and test it through survey experiments. We hypothesize that the efficacy of soft power is limited by the politicization of relations between the sender and target countries. And we find that domestic politics does shape soft power effects. When the bilateral relationships are politicized, soft power efforts can backfire. And within soft power resources, foreign aid is an easy avenue to willing hearts and minds. And so we find that content matters. And we also, for next steps, find that more research on this more institutional and more nuanced political values dimension is needed. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thanks so much to this uh, great team that I'm a member of for this uh, great presentation. Now we have uh, a set of sort of discussion starters uh, to get the conversation rolling. Um, and please also feel free to continue to use uh, the uh, chat function and for um, attendees, uh, you're also welcome to uh, use the, the Q&A function as well. Uh, so first up, we have a Professor Joe Nye from Harvard um, uh, giving us comments on this paper. Thank you. Well, um, I read this paper with great interest and regard it as a important contribution empirically, uh, which has advanced how we think about soft power by using these video clips and survey research. You've made, um, it, uh, you provided empirical evidence from certain things that I had stated uh, in general terms, but never proven. Um, I've often said that soft power um, is distinguished from other types of power in the sense that it depends on the eye of the beholder. Um, and I sometimes use the anecdote that, uh, or little example that uh, if I wanna steal your money with hard power, I pull out a gun, shoot you and take your wallet. And it doesn't matter what you think. But if I wanna steal your money by convincing you I'm a guru and that you should give it to me, all depends on what you think. And so essentially what this paper has done is taken that uh, question and said, all right, how do we see how people think and how does it vary with the different types of soft power resources in the different contexts? So I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important paper which uh, advances empirical evidence for something which previously was uh, made without uh, any evidence. Um, I, I should say that uh, the, uh, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, this question of which types of resources have which types of effects are, are intriguing. I'll give you a, a brief anecdote uh, uh, to illustrate this related to China. I was asked to give a lecture on soft power at the School of Marxism uh, at Beida, Be at Peking University in uh, China uh, uh, oh, a half dozen years ago. And after I spoke to an, an audience of 1500 students and the Dean had introduced me and it, uh, everything was going swimmingly, except I said something about Ai Weiwei and also about Liu Xiaobo. And um, at the end, when Dean came up on the platform again to thank me, he said, oh, it was so great that Professor Nye has come and spoken to us. And then my interpreter stopped interpreting and he kept talking. And then eventually uh, it, it ended up with his thanking me again profusely. And later I asked a friend of mine who was Mandarin speaking, who was in the audience, um, what was that all about? <laughs> he said, what he did was tell the students that Professor Nye may have been the person who coined the term soft power, but he treated it in too much in political terms and not enough in cultural terms. And here in China, we think of it as culture, not politics. So that's an, that's an anecdotal illustration of the difference between 
the uh, three types of resources and how it works out politically. Um, I think the, the interesting question for me, I mean, we, we, you've now demonstrated that priors matter uh, empirically, but I think it would be interesting to know what are the different sources of domestic politicization? And if you're trying to translate this to policy, what are the things that a country can do in its public diplomacy uh, given uh, the politicization that may or may not occur in another country. Uh, for example, uh, how much of the, of the domestic politicization is because of leaders, which the paper refers to leaders um, politicizing it, but sometimes it may be in fact uh, historical and structural. I mean, the Korean attitudes to Japan uh, persisted despite a, right through a conservative Korean government and a liberal or progressive Korean government. And they're now bedeviling the efforts that the Americans are making to try to get Korea and Japan to cooperate on the issue of, of uh, 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 sharing intelligence relating to North Korea and, so, and China. Um, in other words, it may be that the politicization in some cases is is historical and structural. And then the interesting question is to what extent if the Japanese government, for example, wants to exercise public diplomacy and to use its soft power, what can it do? And I didn't, I didn't get an answer to that from the paper. I did get an answer of how it varied by the different uh, resources, but I didn't, I, I, it'd be nice to have another twist of the of the screw on this one step further to know, all right, what could that mean for actual practitioners of public diplomacy? There are also, it would be interesting to know something about time series. I, I, I mean, I, this is a uh, churlish complaint that uh, uh, you don't have time series, but um, if, it would be interesting to know which, what happens when events occur and happens over time, how do these variables change. Um, I noticed that, that you quoted Naima uh, uh, Green Riley's very good uh, uh, thesis on, on soft power saying that, showing that uh, American students who had um, uh, taken uh, uh, courses through Confucius Institutes were not more pro-Chinese, but less so. Uh, be interesting to know if one were to look, I don't know whether Naima, whether you have the data on this or not, it'd be interesting to know whether that would have been true, let's say six or seven years ago before you had the turn in the attitude of Americans relating to China uh, or not. But no, I think if, if for future empirical studies, if we could get more on time series, that would help a lot. And there's also finally the question of, of uh, uh, what policies governments make, which are, which can bring on the, the uh, the backlash that you described. I'm struck, uh, having recently uh, been involved in discussions with Indians in the aftermath of the recent meeting of this Quad uh, that occurred a couple of weeks ago. Um, Indians said that uh, it was intriguing that um, when China started exercising its wolf warrior diplomacy which was obviously based on domestic opinion in China, it was for domestic consumption, that had a terrible effect in India. Uh, not only the killing of Indian uh, troops on the border, but the aftermath of that in which you had Chinese nationalism stimulating Indian nationalist responses, uh, which led incidentally to the banning of TikTok in India. Uh, so it, it'd be interesting to know um, are there certain steps that governments take which can uh, uh, damage or severely damage uh, uh, its, its uh, soft power in another country in which therefore can be avoided? So I, 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 I love I the paper. I thought it was great to have this empirical uh, research, um, I, I, but I kind of, it just made me thirst for more, more on time series, more on a wider set of countries. But anyway, as a, as a major contribution to getting empirical research upon the effects of soft power, uh, my congratulations to the, to the authors, all seven of them. 
Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Nye, um, for that call for more, more research on this important topic, among other things. Uh, next, we have uh, Professor Marie Repnikova. Uh, Maria. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Great. Thank you so much for the invitation. I also really enjoyed the paper. I think it's very rich empirically, but I also found a lot of interesting theoretical insights. For me, one of the big takeaways was also the uh, breakdown of the democratic authoritarian binary in analyzing the effects of soft power, which I think has been overshadowing much of the analysis of soft power, especially when it comes to China. This idea that because China is an autocratic country, its efforts are dismissed um, you know, preemptively or at least considered to be ineffective. And I think your paper shows that the fact that China is an autocratic country doesn't necessarily make it ineffective or failed or failure. And in fact, because Japan is a democratic country doesn't necessarily make it a success. So there's kind of this interesting complication of the democracy autocracy binary in thinking about soft power. I think you could kind of highlight that even more um, in your theoretical contributions. Uh, my comments, some of them also echo Professor Nye's comment about the concept of depoliticization, de kind of how to think about this further. So there are several points I wanted to make. The first one um, is that depoliticization to me, kind of echoing this idea of time series, it, it appears to be a very dynamic concept. So it challenges uh, kind of its operationalization. How do we know for sure when the relationship is politicized versus depoliticized? For example, in 2018, the Malaysian PM publicly canceled a major Chinese infrastructure project creating a rupture in the relationship, but then a year later, he takes a U-turn in resuming the relationship with China. So how does this concept account for this such dynamic shifts and what specific forms of behavior over time kind of amount to this idea of politicization of ties? So kind of how do we know when they're politicized enough or not enough? I think it's kind of a very fluid um, concept in a way and it, and it quickly changes. So maybe it's about watching it or observing it over time, or maybe it's about adding more kind of um, alternative va variables or sub-variables that would help us explain or understand this concept. Uh, the second point in relation to this concept, I think this echoes this idea of kind of this notion that politicization comes from leaders. The way you define it is very top down, that basically the government kind of defines or forms or shapes the opinions of the society when it comes to these various countries. But in reality, it seems that this relationship is often quite interactive, right? The society itself often pushes the government to frame or, or, uh, or implement certain policies um, that are much more politicized. And we see this, of course, in the US, vis-a-vis -vis China. I think it's also notable in the cases you study, um, but also in many other contexts. It seems that the public opinion actually shapes these politicization efforts um, from the top. And then moreover, we also can see that at times, politicization of societal attitudes is not the same thing or it's in contradiction to kind of official policies. So we, I see this a lot in my research in Africa, where with regards to China, we see often very depoliticized, quote, sort of attitudes from the state, but very politicized attitudes um, on a societal level, where the public is very critical uh, of China and has preconceived views about China based on its economic presence, but also various rumors and assumptions about its corrupt practices, interference, Chinese community taking over and so forth. So in a sense, there's kind of this predetermined views that can coexist with official depoliticization. So I think those two can be kind of contradictory. So there is more, I think, to think about there of how do you think about this concept, top down versus bottom up, interactive, contradictory. It's, it's a very interesting um, idea. And thirdly, I think depoliticization almost presumes in your idea, in your paper, it's kind of neutrality, it's the lack of negative framing. But in reality, politicization in, in the other direction is also, I think, quite significant, the pro-China narratives or pro-Japan narratives. In the case of Malaysia, for instance, there's been so much politicization in the case of um, pro-China attitudes in recent years through various state media articles. Just a quick search, I found so many articles that are very positive about China in Malaysian press. That to me signals that there is the kind of the other direction of politicization, which is one could call propaganda, persuasion, and so forth. So how does that play into this picture? Should we look at politicization from the other side as well? In addition to this kind of, I think, thinking about politicization, there are other uh, points, a couple of other points I wanted to make. The first one is about uh, practices of soft power. So you talk a lot about kind of the effects, but when it comes to practices, um, for instance, how do are there any major distinctions in how China and Japan practice soft power? You mentioned the resources, but do they kind of enact it differently? In one part of your paper, you note how Japan practices foreign aid more through small scale projects, as opposed to large scale visible or what some scholars refer to as prestige projects um, that are implemented by China. Another notable difference might be that more, there's more state directed way of soft power implementation in China versus more kind of bottom up implementation from Japan. Another might be in the emphasis of the key offerings of soft power, which I guess is hard to capture in this paper. But in my research, I find that China's approach to soft power is distinctively pragmatic, for instance, much less so ideational. And precisely because of its pragmatic approach that prioritizes access and material benefits, it appears to be relatively well received in parts of global south. 
So what is what are the distinctions between, I think, Japan in this case and China when it comes to their practices, their offerings, not only when it comes to effects? I think that would be very interesting to at least mention somewhere um, in the paper. And I think finally, while it's impossible to, I guess, address any uh, or all possible alternative factors or forces that could shape the attitudes towards soft power in this context, it's important to at least consider two complementary, I think, explanations. One is economic. Um, both um, South Korea and Malaysia have very strong relations, trade relations with China, but less so with Japan. So there's an economic kind of dimension there, but also Malaysia clearly has a much stronger dependency uh, on China with the BRI. So how does this economic factor feature into politicization or the attitudes vis-a-vis -vis, um, vis -vis China and Japan? And another complementary factor is cultural proximity. You mentioned the diasporic kind of factor briefly, but according to some estimates, there's almost 23% of Chinese, um, ethnic Chinese um, in living in Malaysia. So how does this shape the potential views on China and responses to soft power, especially because one of China's soft power and what some also describe as sharp power strategies is to target Chinese communities overseas. So at the very least, some of these people might be also answering your questions in the survey because it's a very high percentage. So I think that would be very interesting. And the last point that just came up to me after listening to the presentation is this idea of clarifying or complicating the notion of political values. I would strongly suggest that because the notion of protest and especially anti-Hong Kong or sorry, Hong Kong anti-government protest is very, I mean, it's, it's an automatically negative depiction of China. But of course, if you think about China's political values, at least from my analysis of the training materials, when they train elites is mostly about meritocracy, state capacity and accountability. So that, that's what they advertise. So it, maybe you know, adding something from their perspective would be useful to, again, de-westernize um, this idea of soft power. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Repnikova. Uh, next, we have Professor Atushi Tago. Yeah. Let me share the screen. Um, for the non-native non English speaker, being a third discussant for, you know, afterwards of the excellent scholar is the toughest job. And let me, let me uh, screen share what I have think about the paper. So highly commendable points of the paper and the project. I assume that the, it's not the only outcome of this large probably project. So attention and new evidence on the backfire is quite interesting. Um, I, I think it's a very good way to direct the research. An experiment in Malaysia, I think it's a relatively new and also commendable point. And then more specifically, I would like to hear because I know you have, you guys have done the second wave. So long-term effect, or well, from Professor uh, Joseph Nye's comment, it have to be probably over a year, over months, but the still the ex, as an experiment scholar who have been working on the public diplomacy, a week, year, a week old panel is also kind of commendable. So one of the hardest challenges for scientific public diplomacy or the soft uh, scholars how long the effect of the information um, continue is the, one of the key, um, probably the challenge. And you guys are doing that and I commend that. By the way, that they already nicely cited my work, so I shouldn't be greedy on that, but they actually I have the another <laughs> project that I used the video. Uh, and by the way, it's a co uh, co work by uh, of the uh, Tetsuro Kobayashi of the University of City, uh, Hong, uh, City University of Hong Kong. Uh, it's 38 seconds above the 38 parallel. So it's the, um, about the Korea and Japan and the, it's the US military made, made video. Um, I guess it can be somehow related to what you're doing, but the, the, given that I know how tough to do the video uh, type of the experiment. And that may be one of the critical points that I would raise. So I, I I enjoyed reading the paper, but I have some couple of questions and suggestions. And the, I saw that the first that the three peers I know many of the discuss. I mean the panelists already um, raised their their concerns or their questions regarding that point. But so I make my statement very briefly. But the I, I think your manuscript can be much stronger to defend why those three are key and why we really have to focus on those. And second, um, why two countries? Oh, obviously, many people would come up with this question, but the, I think you need to um, mention, uh, for instance, the status of or role of the media of each country because the public promises soft power. We, I mean, media definitely uh, plays a significant role there. And I'm curious how the authors evaluate the role of media 
uh, in public diplomacy or soft power in general and in your study. And I saw that you didn't mention anything on that. So somehow I'm very curious. And the most importantly, use of video, there's a pro and con. And for the negative people I faced with my papers, uh, left leads, they were relatively nice still, but they raised the question like, what were they really watching and what information had been um, given or had been received or more precisely manipulated? Um, I, I think that one is probably the toughest question to you, too. Uh, five, I think, I, I wonder, um, was it like a, in that competing setting of the public diplomacy information, history issues or peaceful country image of China and Japan, I would, I, I might do that. So if you have the continuation of the project, you can probably try that in the future, or at least you have to probably defend in a footnote or something that, you know, why those leads are, the, you know, by design or empirical reasons. I don't know what, what, what would be the rationale, but the, you probably, um, defend yourself there. And by uh, for the sixth point, uh, I think pre-treated long-term effect is diff quite different from Korea and Malaysia. I assume that more exposure to the Japanese manga in the ROK. So for the negative or null results for the South Korea on the Totoro, because, because they already watched them, you know, repeatedly or too much. <laughs> so I, I, I I don't know. Um, uh, I guess the pretty long-term effect, how do you evaluate? How do you think about that? And that will be the question. And finally, um, I really enjoyed the project, but the I kind of feel kind of puzzling on this point. So what would be the solutions for the backfire? So for the Japanese government, <laughs> I think public diplomacy is do, you know, have been done in order not to politicize the image of Japan. <laughs> so <laughs> by design, it's very puzzling paper for me. Uh, and if you, you know, at least mention about the potential solutions for the backfire, it'll probably break, uh, you know, and it would be much more significant contribution in the public diplomacy studies. And that's it. So I'll return the floor to the Great, thank you so much, Professor Tago, for those for those comments. Um, so we have one more discussion with with brief comments, uh, Professor Kobayashi. And as Professor Professor Kobayashi is actually going to be a sort of switch hitter today, and because of a communication staff, who he's provided comments for both papers. Um, but uh, but brief uh, brief comments, and while Professor Kobayashi is uh, talking, please feel free to use the raise hand feature uh, if you want to jump in on the discussion, um, and I will. Uh, get to you after uh, we go first to Professor Kobayashi. Thank you. Uh, the reality is I was completely confused and I, I read the wrong paper. So I, I was, I'm assigned to the second paper, but I realized that I read the first paper. So I'm going to split my discussion time into, into half and half, and I'm going to spend 2.5 minutes for each. So uh, let me rush for, for, for my, my comments for the first paper. Uh, I learned a lot from this paper and, and thank you very much. And uh, so interesting. Although I'm not an a, a expert of soft power, because uh, I study public opinion in East Asian countries is, is so much interesting. It's a really uh, kind of imminent issue, uh, uh, especially when I'm you know living in Hong Kong and I see a lot of you know hard and soft power of uh, from China. So uh, I would like to raise only one theoretical question and two uh, methodological questions. One is about so uh, although already you know many uh, people have pointed out, I had a uh, uh, question: Is foreign aid really a part of uh, soft power? So uh, in the case of uh, China's foreign aid, for instance, there are always uh, suspicious, uh, suspicions of so-called uh, debt trap. And there's also an alleged motive uh, behind it to secure supporting voices in the United Nations, for instance. And uh, so the more recent case is, that, for instance, the, the vaccine diplomacy, so-called vaccine diplomacy, is it is, is part of foreign aid. But for instance, Paraguay was asked by China to cut off diplomatic relations with, with Taiwan in exchange for providing the vaccine. So obviously, there are some kind of overlap between this kind of seemingly soft power and uh, uh, environment endeavor, strategies and uh, the hard part, which, which basically coerce uh, uh, some specific type of actions of the recipient of this uh, aid. So that's my uh, theoretical question. The, the two uh, methodological questions concerns the experimental stimuli. 
Um, so the design of experiments uh, is very much interesting, but uh, if I uh, take a closer look into the, the treatments, for instance, in the uh, Japanese foreign aid treatment, it includes uh, its support for the POSCO uh, in, in South Korea, which is actually a very sensitive issue in South Korea. Uh, with regard to the uh, the Japanese financial aid and its recipient in South Korea after 1965 uh, treaty. Uh, it is not difficult to imagine that some South Korean participants are offended by this uh, reference to POSCO, for instance. Uh, the Chinese foreign aid treatment also includes its support for Malaysian uh, sea freight. So this kind of bilateral uh, 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 foreign aid is actually uh, included in this uh, stimuli. And that would have some kind of specific effects depending on the context of these uh, bilateral relations. Uh, the, th the last point is about uh, uh, the Hong Kong protest. Uh, 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 so I, I actually didn't understand why Hong Kong protest signifies the political value of China. Um, the, uh, because the recent protests in Hong Kong are labeled as a pro-independence movement by the Chinese uh, central government. So the government initially censored the protest related information in the mainland and afterward it severely attacked the movement. So, the, so therefore the Hong Kong protests have never been something that China would like to sell to the world. Uh, moreover, harsh uh, clampdown of the protests invoked a lot of you know, international criticism. So I think uh, the political value that China wants to sell is uh, stability instead of this kind of, you know, hey, we also accept uh, protests that kind of, you know, we are also free society, that kind of things. So I guess uh, it might be uh, uh, worthwhile, you know, uh, elaborating more of the values that, what kind of values that each country would like to sell. So in the case of Japan, it might be like kind of Article 9, uh, uh, rather than just showing the uh, anti-government protest. So that would be more general and you know fundamental value that Japan has something to sell to the world. Thank you very much. I'm going to send the, 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 all the comments to the authors later. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Kobayashi. I really, uh, and to professors uh, Tago, Repnikova, and Nai for those really fantastic comments. Uh, and all of, the, all of these points are very well taken. I'm, however, I'm gonna, as hard as it is as a moderator, I'm gonna muzzle myself because we have uh, a, a great group of people with their uh, hands raised. And so um, with the uh, permission of the other, my other teammates who, um, uh, who are free to jump in, I wanna just kind of keep going with the questions and maybe at the end, uh, we'll have a minute or two where we can respond a little bit, but mostly at this point, I, I'd love to listen. Um, so first on the list, we have uh, Mike Thomas. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I really enjoyed reading this paper and I'm grateful for the opportunity to listen to the presentation and to the discussion so far. Uh, you've already been asking questions about the details of the um, treatments and the data. I wanted to ask two big picture questions about the punchline of the paper. One is theoretical and the other uh, is practical. So at a theoretical level, one way I think to read this paper is to say that the paper is claiming that attempts to promote soft power will fail if the intended audiences are hostile to the message. Or if you want to flip that around, another way of saying is that the countries are more likely to be successful at promoting soft power when they're preaching to the choir uh, than when they're not. So I wanted, so my first question is whether at a theoretical level, you think that that's a fair reading of the paper? And if so, if you think that that's a surprising theoretical claim. Um, my second question is about the practical implications of your research for policymakers. So another big picture takeaway or way to read this paper is that efforts to promote soft power are most likely to fail in dyads where soft power might be most needed. Uh, and if you think that that's a fair reading, do you think your findings might be discouraging to policymakers who uh, want to use soft power as a way to improve relations in dyads that might not otherwise be harmonious? Great, uh, thank you. Next, uh, Professor Amy Katalinik. Yeah, I also really enjoyed the paper and the presentation. Um, it's just fascinating. So my comment is sort of jumping off something that Mike said. So one of your conclusions, I think, is that soft power, it just doesn't work in politicized environments when the relationship between the sender and the target is politicized. So that suggests that if, if that's the case, governments shouldn't be directing soft power resources uh, to those countries. And I wonder if a really nice compliment to your experiment might be to look at the composition of governments 
soft power resources? Do we see a bias in, in directing those resources toward countries where they're going to work? Um, and your theory would lead us to expect that governments, if they're smart, uh, should not be spending too much money in politicised environments. And I just wonder if that's the case. And I also just to echo what, what Mike said, it is interesting to think about the fact that that is sort of where soft power should be most directed. So it sort of might help us advance the concept of soft power to understand, you know, when and why it's used. And, and I'm in general just a, a fan of observational work, uh, especially when it complements experiments. But thank you for the opportunity to read the paper and see the presentation. Great, uh, thanks so much. Next we have uh, Jennifer Lind and Benjamin Goldsmith. Hi everyone, lovely to see everybody. I hope you're all well. Um, I just had a couple comments on this, this really interesting paper. Um, so I don't work in the soft power realm so much, so I would love to see you kind of frame it by, by first establishing, um, you know, <clears throat> soft power matters, here's why, here's the empirical support, right? So, so point us to the studies that, that show that this, this actually has this effect. Um, also uh, to say, well, soft power comes from many sources, but, um, but one way that we know that countries can get soft power is through their policies. So, so you know, and here's, here's why we know this, here's the empirical support and so on. So again, it's, um, it's establishing that soft power is not just something that a country is or that relates to its generalized foreign policy, but that you can I don't want to say buy soft power, but that you can you can affect it through government policies to, you know, to um, to make your country seem more favorably. Um, so again, it would be soft power matters. Um, soft power uh, comes from both who you are and what you do, but also through deliberate, um, proactive efforts to cultivate it. And, and then the question of your paper could be, okay, so under what conditions will a country be more successful at, at cultivating it? And, and I think that that brings you to your paper. Um, I, I had, so again, I, there's so much to like here and um, I had so many questions, but, but one thing I'll just mention that I, um, that, that kind of stuck out was on, unsurprisingly on the issue of historical memory, um, the paper creates these, these three categories of, of culture, politics, and foreign policy. And you talk about if, if relations are bad in the culture realm, then they'll only be aggravated by a government's efforts to build soft power in that realm. Um, and so that made me, me wonder about, um, uh, you know, this culture category. Um, I guess I'm, I'm not sure about the connection between, like, Japanese anime and sushi and um, political apologies, right? Which you kind of put it in that category. Um, and so these things just seem really different to me. Again, the paper says that relations between South Korea and Japan are politicized because of culture, historical grievances and diplomatic conflicts. And a lot of that sounds like politics to me. Um, and in fact, I think of the countries as actually having really good cultural relations, you know, K-pop and J-pop and, and all the things that they, they, they share. And so um, again, it's mostly politics, uh, political apologies and the territorial dispute over Dokuto and Takashima that seem to be the root of the problem. Um, so again, I was confused about putting everything into that kind of culture bucket. Um, I had one one reaction in terms of, um, at the end of the day, people could say, okay, these are just these single case studies. You have one neutral, as you called it, country. You had one politicized country, and maybe you've just taught us something about Malaysia and Japan, Is or sorry, Malaysia and Korea. Um, is there something kind of simple that you could do to bolster yourselves against that kind of charge? So maybe, um, obviously not running this whole thing <laughs> again in, in these other countries, but um, like Mechanical Turk uh, in, in, you know, some smaller study where you could just kind of kick the tires of it in, you know, um, in, in other countries that, um, you know, Singapore and, you know, 
um, Philippines, Australia, um, you know, European countries or something like that. Um, if there would be something kind of simple that you could do in like three or four, four or five other countries that people would agree, yeah, they're, they're quite neutral. And if you, you found actually quite similar findings, I think that would, that would bolster the credibility of your answer. Yeah, and I guess I'm next. <clears throat> so uh, just a couple of comments. Yeah, thanks very much. I, I also really, really like the paper and find it, find it um, uh, fascinating and providing a lot of important insights. Um, a couple of, of comments. Uh, one reflects a comment I have in the, in the chat that I, I especially like the focus on competition in the theoretical discussion and, and the framing. But I also think that's really um, underdeveloped in, in the theory, especially. I, I, it's, it's mentioned in the theory is presented as a theory of soft power competition. Um, I, I would be pretty excited to see a, a nicely developed theory when, for example, when two states intend to compete, uh, you know, I think you, you mentioned China and the U.S. as the obvious example, uh, you know, think of Africa or South America and, of course, Asia as well. But Japan and, and China are clearly competing and intend to compete, in, in my view, in, in Asia, in the soft power realm. Um, but as the theory, you know, as it's spelled out and most parts of the study are, are sort of bilateral uh, in, in the way they're set up. Uh, and the second comment um, is about uh, the, the role of, of culture. So I think there's, there's an issue with um, the way culture is discussed. I think it, it needs to be defined much, much more clearly. Anything from being cool to, to different modes of entertainment um, uh, can sort of fit in that, in that box. And it's not clear, at least to me, how, how that, that very diverse set of factors might, might have an impact. Um, so those are my my two comments. I, I have. I'll, I'll send you written comments as as well on the on the whole paper. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, next we have uh, Philip Lipsy and then Michael Tees after that. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like this paper. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to read it. So I, I had uh, two comments. I have a bunch more, but I'll, I'll just focus on two. So so one of them is similar to what uh, Atsushi was saying in in his. Uh, discussing comments, which is I felt like the paper might need some kind of theory about how existing public diplomacy efforts relate to the methodology, right? In, in other words, you know, if Japan is very active in public diplomacy efforts in a country, is your treatment effect going to be attenuated because citizens are already being aggressively primed with the same kind of information and does the degree of public diplomacy differ between Korea and Malaysia, for example, the assumption seems to be it's gonna be the same, there is no effect, but is, is that really true? Um, I mean, the other possibility is that through these existing efforts, citizens would become more susceptible to prime somehow. So that, that might be another possibility, but in either case, I think some discussion of that would be useful. Um, and the second point was, you know, my observation of the public diplomacy strategy uh, as, as it's occurring seems to be focused lately on opinion leaders and uh, I've, I've even heard influencers used by some officials and, and sort of thinking about that mechanism, right? So if these messages are coming from people you trust within your own country, does that make a difference versus if it's obviously coming from the, the source country, because that, that seems to be, at least from my sort of very qualitative impressionistic sense, where a lot of the attention is going in the public diplomacy sphere these days is let's focus on these people who have a lot of Twitter followers and try to change their mind. Um, so for future research, that might be worth thinking about. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, Michael, please is next. Ah, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, going this late, uh, some of the points I wanted to make have already been made, uh, particularly by Jennifer and Ben. Um, 
so let me let me try to uh, summarize what I see as sort of the source of some of these uh, concerns, and that is that while you you run the experiment in the way you should and you check for balance within your cases in all the right ways and you have enough, presumably enough power to to make the inferences you want to make within the cases for the kind of big points that you're making in the paper what you really have is an n of two right you've got south korea and malaysia and i guess two senders as well and a lot of the questions i think come from the notion that you acknowledge in the paper that there are a lot of differences uh, between these countries um, that may be confounding um, at least your interpretations of the results that you're that you're finding so um, one thing that struck me on the aid treatment in particular is that i just i just looked and at least according to the imf south korea now has a higher per capita income than japan uh, and much, much higher than China, of course. So aid, who knows how aid plays, and particularly Japanese aid plays in the Korean sort of imagination. Is it is it envy? Is it jealousy? Is it resentment? What, what's going on? Um, there's a lot, there's a lot there. And then, you know, South Korea's smack in the middle of Japan and China. It's affected by how hard power in lots of ways. Um, it's it's different from Malaysia in so many ways that it's hard to isolate um the thing that's really causing the difference is it is it this politicization of the bilateral relationship or is it something else um on the politicization i will echo the the points made earlier that that um i think it would be useful for you at the very least in the conclusion uh to suggest more systematic ways to measure politicization so I think you started with these two cases where you, Korea and Malaysia, where you just figured this is going to be uncontroversial. Everyone's going to agree that that the relationships between Korea and the two uh, the two senders are clearly politicized. And for Malaysia, there doesn't seem to be any evidence of that. Um, it'd be nice. It's always Professor and I use the the word churlish. It's always difficult to to comment on an experiment to say, well, here's all the things you should have done. Um, but to have sort of off diagonal cases, right, where one of them had a politicized relationship with China, but not with Japan and the other vice versa, if there are any, any such cases, to get a little bit of leverage on that. Um, I also wanted to echo what uh, Jennifer said about, uh, about the treatment of culture in Korea. To my understanding, culture gets sort of um, uh, hijacked in the politics of the relationship between the two countries there's no particular cultural disputes specifically but but because culture and uh and um industry uh money are so related the south korean government likes to use culture as sort of a weapon um in its politicized political disputes with japan so is it distinct is the is the fraught nature of their relationship, the politicization of the relationship, really about culture, or is culture just being used there? And so then you're going is it really a good case for finding the impact of the cultural treatments uh, that you're looking for? Um, again, to echo Professor Nye's claim or uh, point about time series, you do mention COVID as as a p potential issue for doing this in February of 21, but just any snapshot. Uh, is is going to be a bit of an issue because diplomacy is a continuous thing. It, you know, it waxes and wanes. South Korea and Japan, for example, or or with China, you know, the relationship warms and it cools and it warms and it cools. And so, if the questions happen to be asked of people at a time when when the South Korean government is explicitly or implicitly, uh, you know, organizing a boycott of Japanese cultural products, you're going to get a very different set of answers probably from your respondents than if it's in a, in a warmer period for whatever. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to say is, and, and here Jennifer really did kind of anticipate um, one of my suggestions, which is for those of us who are not already steeped in the literature on soft power, um, a slightly more a rigorous summary of, of that literature about why it matters and, and about how it works, uh, uh, I think would be useful for, for, especially if you want to send this to sort of a general interest journal. Um, 
And how it works, what I mean by that is your, your measure is looking at these surveys. Um, and I guess this could be said about the other paper that we'll discuss next too, are looking at sort of the impact on public opinion, right? Just the average citizen in the street and how do they, what are their feelings about this country in terms of trust or things like that. How does that translate to the, the, the goals that the sending country is actually seeking to fulfill? So how does, how does, how does a warm feeling about Japan or about China, um, you know, make its way up to your own government's relationship with the sending country? I'm sure this is in the literature already in general terms, but if, if you could, um, if you could summarize that for the reader, but then also think about how you might, um, get at that in terms of, in terms of your, your examination. So this may be more of an observational accompaniment to the experiment, but just, uh, as a comparativist who doesn't study international relations and soft power, the so what question really was, you know, flashing over my head as I was reading. It's like, you know, this is all kind of very interesting internally within the experiment, but especially when you were looking for um, sort of the longevity of these things and you said you did a follow up a, a week later or something like that, a couple of weeks later. And I think in, in, in the other paper, it was, they showed results that lasted three weeks or something like that. What's three weeks in, in a diplomatic relationship? Um, you know, how, how big a deal is this? Uh, some sense of that. So I'm not necessarily saying it's not a big deal, but sell it to the reader. Great, thank you. And then uh, finally, uh, Su Jung Lim. And maybe uh, Tae Ho Kim, you also, okay. Thank you for um, sharing a fascinating research with us. I actually shared uh, many uh, points, so many uh, strong uh, points about the paper, but I also share um, some of the concerns about the, um, the treatments, whether the treatments are actually manipulating the things that the authors wanted to, to manipulate. And on that point, um, if you were to do a follow-up survey or, or redesign the survey, one thing I just wanted to suggest as also one of the South Korean audience in the room was to make the treatment sharper and in doing so also try to make it more, more relational, more directed um, and, and sort of um, centering on, on the empathy. So in these treatment across all three issue areas, the treatments were videos, it doesn't have any particular target. It doesn't at least mention the target. But I think what South Koreans um, especially appreciate when it comes to the relationship with Japan, especially the ordinary uh, public in South Korea, is how some of the Japanese, some of the Japanese politicians are actually thinking similarly with Koreans. So maybe if the, some of the treatments, maybe not in terms of the video, which is, is which is harder, but in just traditional vignettes, if somehow, for instance, the political value treatment mentions how as democracy, we Japan are quite similar to Korea in having this um, vibrant civil society. Uh, in, in, in this way, you can make the public diplomacy activity relational and, and uh, resort to, to uh, sort of empathy. I think this might be the key actually in, in how the public diplomacy should be conducted in a, in a more politicized and a, and a rivalry sort of setting, because in that way you can kind of see how Japan is also reaching out to us Koreans, not just to, to the broader audience across the globe. So I think, um, I, I just wonder if this sort of more relational message, more directed message have a different impact, especially if the, the impact, the modular impact could be greater when uh, under the conditions of, of politicization. Also about the, the um, measuring of the dependent variable, I was wondering if you can take advantage of the competition environment here between Japan and Korea, and whether you actually had a, a forced choice type of DV, whether you will, you will um, cooperate more with China or Japan sort of thing, instead of just um, asking them one by one and say, if um, this competition, even though there is a slight backlash, maybe still then the, the, the recipient of the public diplomacy would choose us over the, the competitor. So I just wanted to see how this competition dynamic might be incorporated into the survey design, especially in the, in the East Asian context. That's it for me. 
Great, thank you. And last, uh, uh, Teho Kim. Thank you. I really enjoyed uh, good comments. And uh, just to try to add two small points, one about uh, case selection and second one, uh, policy recommendation. I think a, the motivation to start this paper comes from Japan-China regional rivalry. Hard power rivalry between uh, one US ally and uh, one competitor of US. And then you became curious how these two countries soft power works for Korea. Which means you picked up case out of strong hard power and then try to relate soft power to explain your hard power relationship. But reality, South Korea is a more strong soft power sender to China and Japan in K-pops and sports and cultures. And China controls Korean soft power and Japan just to leave it to play in domestic politics. So I think uh, you should think about the influence of soft power of South Korea to these great powers if you try to academically uh, compare the role of soft and hard power. My second point is about the solution. The, this paper is very strong in the deductive logic. The key is a politicization in domestic politics. But the problem is South Korea's domestic politicization on history issue. Here, the key is who captured the power in South Korean politics? If you look at the past 20 years history, whenever controversial, uh, a conservative righty uh, political camp captures Korean power, a Korea-Japan relations get ease and much more cooperative and security issues. But like this time, liberal and lefty governments captures power, all problems becomes politicized. So this paper implies Korean domestic politics, which cannot be controlled by Japan and China, will decide the impact of hard power and soft power relationship between Japan and Korea, between uh, Korea and China and Korea and Japan. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thanks. Thank you to all of the panel participants and especially to our discussants, Professor Jonai, Professor Maria Repnikova, Professor Tushitago, and Professor Tsutsuro Kobayashi uh, for those fantastic comments. I, I'm again going to resist the urge to give a lengthy response to these great, great suggestions um, and, uh, you know, points to push our thinking further along. So I think that it you know, whether it's thinking carefully about what the treatments are manipulating, what's what are giving us, which is something we can clarify, to these bigger questions about the theory that the paper is trying to develop. I mean, I think as, you know, Professor Nyan, Rep. and a bunch of people suggested, you know, thinking thinking over time and how this changes and how, as, as you know, uh, Professor Catalinic suggested, you know, how governments are actually doing this can help to answer this question that Mike Tom's asked about, you know, what, What's theoretically interesting? What's theoretically interesting here? Um, so this has given us great food for thought. So I really appreciate it. I'm mindful, however, that everyone was promised a Zoom break, um, and so I do want to to stick to that while still giving uh, the next paper presenters ample time to discuss their really excellent, exciting uh, paper. So uh, as planned, let's try to come back at uh, at eight forty. So it gives us a slightly shorter break than planned, but still maybe a little time to walk around and uh, uh, get away from our screen. So thanks, thanks again so much, and I'll see everybody in about eight minutes. Thank you. <laughs>